open up the newspaper in any country on any day, you're guaranteed to find an article with this topic. And you find a multitude of views. So there are young people who feel that they've done everything that they've been asked to do. They've gone to school, they've studied, and they've worked hard, and they emerge without a job. There are employers who feel that they are struggling to find the skills that they need for even entry-level positions. And there are governments that are grappling with what to do with youth unemployment in order to be able to ensure that they have viable economies and societies. So what we decided to do with this particular piece of research is that, and what really motivated it, is that although there are lots of perspectives on the table about what is it that is the nature of this problem, there's very little that actually underlies precisely why do we see what we see in the world today? And how is it that young people, employers, uh, and education providers see the exact same situation in such very different ways. So with that, let me introduce you to what we did with our research. So in the case of Europe, um, and, and, and I should say that uh, in 2012, we did a global report, um, and which was similar to this, and then on the basis of that, decided to do a deep dive in Europe itself, simply because of the magnitude of the crisis here on the youth employment topic. Um, so in the case of Europe, we surveyed over 8,000 young people, education providers, and, and employers. Um, and we also then uh, were able to go visit over 100 education to employment programs across 25 countries in order to really understand when it works, what does it look like, and what are the commonalities that we see across them. So what I'll do here is share the findings from both of those fact bases. So the first lesson, which came out very stridently in the case of Europe, is that although we find very high youth unemployment in Europe, we still are not finding employers who are, who are able to get the skills that they need. And so in particular, historically, when you look over the last two decades, you find that youth unemployment in Europe has systematically outpaced average adult unemployment. So this is not a new problem. What is, in, what is new is that with the onset of the recession, the problem became much more acute. And what happened was that young people began to be competed out of the market as more, as, as more workers stayed in the job market and as more new entrants came into the job market. And, what, and why, why were they competing now? And this, in many ways, says it all. Um, what we found is that, although you would suspect that employers would find finding people like fishing in an ocean, given the high degrees of unemployment, that's not what we heard from them. So first of all, 40% of employers said that they cannot find the skills they need for even entry-level positions. And then second, what you see here is that a third of employers said that they're facing significant business consequences as a result. And interestingly, those employers who say that they face the most strident business consequences are in the countries with the highest youth unemployment. Now, what lies beneath that? Uh, so, I mentioned before that we sought to ask the same question to all three parties in order to understand how they see the world in very different ways. So one example of that is with regards to the readiness of graduates for the workforce. So we found that somewhere between 35 and 38% of young people and employers said that graduates are ready for the job market. In contrast, we found that almost 75% of education providers said that graduates are ready for the job market. Now what explains that? When we then turned to say, okay, well, are you looking at job placement data? You know, what is it that causes that optimism? There is almost a third of, of education providers that can't even answer that question about where are young people actually landing. And then those that do 
often underestimate by a significant margin. So this just goes to one of the points of, it's a data-free zone on some level, um, in that the ability to know what is actually happening in the market and why we see these phenomena is not today underpinned by a hard set of data. Next, um, if we just take the perspective of young people, and here we ask the question, so do you believe that you have the information you need to be able to decide what to study and where to study? And this is information like job openings, uh, wage levels, career trajectories, etc. What we found is that on average, um, and this is now from the global data, only about 45% of young people felt that they had the information they needed. And in the UK, it was only 30%. Now, this is interesting um, because what we would say is that if, if, if you look at things like the, uh, like the National Career Services, there is actually a significant amount of data that is available relative to what we see in other countries. However, the presence of data is different than the awareness of data and its usage. Um, and, this is, and this is quite critical. You know, so it is one thing to have the data, but it is entirely different to ensure that young people are actively using it in the decisions that they make about what they do and why they do it. And, and we'll come to this theme a bit later. So now if I just turn to uh, the points of friction, and I, I should say first that we sought to understand what was happening at each of the three milestones in the journey from education to employment. And we define those milestones as one, deciding to enroll in post-secondary education. The second was actually learning skills. And then the third was finding a job. So I'll just briefly describe the points of friction on all three. So first, in terms of enrolling, when we asked those young people who did not pursue post-secondary education, what, was the, what were the reasons behind that? The number one reason across all countries was affordability. And this was interesting because in the case of Europe, uh, education is, so in terms of tuition, is often either free or highly subsidized. What this remark is about is with regards to living expenses. So because young people often have to go to a different town in order to be able to access their post-secondary seat. So affordability, very big driver. But there were also other drivers. So for example, in the case of the UK, 24% of, of youth said that they were not interested in pursuing post-secondary education because they didn't feel it was going to make a difference in their livelihood. And contrast that to, for example, 7% in Germany. Um, so there are, there are values that young people were placing on whether or not they felt post-secondary education was going to be a vehicle to a better future. And the UK was on the higher side of not interested or don't believe that that there's value there. The second part of deciding to enroll is what do you decide to enroll in? Um, and in particular, with regards to vocational relative to academic paths. And so, similar to what we find across all countries, not just in Europe, but globally, we find that, uh, this, is, this though is, is for the UK data. So the vast majority of students say that vocational education is more likely to be helpful to them in finding a job. But only a minority would say that it's valued by society. And so therefore, they end up with a significantly lower margin deciding to actually pursue vocational education. And it's because of this tension between, I think it's more important, but I know society doesn't value it, and so I'm not going to go that path, even though I think it might be better for me. Uh, we find this pattern consistently across all countries, with the exception of Germany, where it's, where it's equally regarded in terms of vocational and academic. If we now go turn to the, the question of building skills. So here, what we find is that across the board, young people believe that hands-on learning is by far the most effective way for them to absorb skills. And yet, only about 40% of young people find themselves in academic or vocational programs that enable them to learn that way. So this is, again, one of the mismatches of not only do young people 
say that they value a different way of learning. Employers also say something similar, um, but we're not yet at the position of creating programs that enable them to learn in, that, in, the, in the manner that they view as most effective for them. And then lastly on this front, little surprise that due to the mismatches along the way, we find that less than half of young people believe that their post-secondary education helped them to find a job. And this for us was actually one of the most tragic findings of the work. Now, it's important to note that this is obviously a perception. So there is an abundance of, of evidence um, in the economics field with regards to how a degree is a material influencer of, of, your, of your lifetime earnings. Um, and so there is an abundance of that data, but the reality is that these young people at this moment in time are simply not seeing it because they are seeing rejection after rejection in the job market. Now, if I just now turn to um, a segmentation analysis, which, which we did, and let me just explain it a bit. Employers and young people are not monolithic entities. We often treat them as though they are, but that's simply not the case. And so we went through and did a segmentation of both employers and of young people on the view that you need different types of interventions to be able to support different types of employers and young people. Um, I'll, I'll just share here the employer segmentation. And the reason why to do so is the following. There is an important school of thought that says there really is no education employment gap. It doesn't exist. What's happening is that employers are shirking on their responsibilities in training young people. And that's the reason that we see the gap today. So we wanted to put that theory to the test. And so what we have here, uh, we identified four different segments. This is, this is, for, this is the UK data. Uh, there are two segments, the renowned and the engaged, that are investing actually significantly in getting the right skills, in training, in actively recruiting from different channels. So they are investing and they are getting results that they need for their particular business. But then there are two other segments where, so, so the, what, what we call the standalones and the disengaged. So the, the standalones recognize that they need to invest mm -hmm. in the skill gap, but they aren't really collaborating with other players, be it education providers or other employers. So they're finding it a bit tough and therefore are not getting very much out of the investment which they make. And then there are the disengaged, which are essentially companies that realize, well, I know it's a problem, but I just simply don't have the wherewithal to do anything about it today. And by the way, the majority of the standalones and the disengaged, the, you, you will find a preponderance of small and medium enterprises in these categories. Um, so what this is saying is that it is not the case that all employers are not engaging and delivering, there are a segment that actually are quite active in this space. But equally important, there's a segment that is ineffective or not doing anything at all. Um, and this is an important challenge, particularly given the presence of small and medium enterprises who often simply don't have the wherewithal to be able to invest in order to be able to get to a better training solution uh, for their young people and for the staff. If I now turn to what do we do about it? Um, and here, within the report, we had a multitude of, of, of recommendations. I'll just focus here on those that most greatly affect scale. And, and the reason why is the following. I mentioned that we looked at over 100 examples of education to employment programs across 25 countries. Across the board, we found some very successful programs. But the challenge is that they only help hundreds of young people, maybe thousands, but very rarely the hundreds of thousands and millions of young people who we know need this kind of support. In fact, across the 100, we really only found three programs that are achieving 100,000 young people annually. So the question is, how do you achieve scale and how do you do it at a fast pace? Um, and what we found was amongst the most powerful <coughs> solutions on this front was through sector or function-driven consortiums. Um, and the reason why is because when you have employers across a sector coming together to say, 
these are the skills that we need. And actively collaborating with education providers to deliver those skills, then it creates a much more powerful force than if it's a single company that is seeking to make this kind of a shift. So I'll just give you a few examples. So uh, in, in terms of a sector, uh, so even in the hyper-competitive automotive sector, in the US, there is uh, something called the Automotive Manufacturing Technical Education Collaborative. It brings together over 30 auto companies and over 30 uh, community colleges across 13 states in the US. They went through and defined what are the core skills that anyone who is an engineer or a technician on the shop floor should have. And they then created partnerships with the community colleges and the universities to deliver this kind of a program. It is over 50% practicum, um, and it, is, it has now become the badge of honor within the industry. So there's no question that if you emerge from this program, you have the skills to be effective on, on the shop floor. Another example is by function. Uh, so in some cases, employers worry about coaching. And so they're not keen to necessarily be a part of a collaborative within a, within a certain sector. And so here we found examples of, of a particular skill, so such as mechatronics, where multiple companies from different industries who all have a need for that particular skill come together in order to be able to produce that kind of person. So this is the example of Apprenticeship 2000 which uh, produces a cadre of mechatronics workers. So mechatronics is a combination of computer science, uh, mechanic, me mechanical, electrical, process, etc. cetera. Um, and it's a very scarce breed of person, but you need this person for any automated facility. And a third example is working down supply chain. Uh, so we've seen examples where anchor companies essentially say to their suppliers, that because you have a skills problem, I have a skills problem. So they invest in order to bring the rest of the supply chain, which often does include small and medium enterprises, to upgrade the support that they're giving to their entry level workers and even professional development beyond. Um, and then lastly, um, we've also seen efforts geared towards small and medium enterprises themselves. Uh, so there are often these group training organizations that essentially will hire on workers, train them, and then allocate them across different employers. So I, I offer these as, as simple examples of how we've seen collaborations, very powerful ones, occur across employers, even in the most competitive of industries, to be able to crack the talent gap. It happens. It's not a mirage but the world needs to systematically make much more of these types of programs come together. Um, I'll offer just one more example before pausing, which is, um, again, to the point of how to achieve scale. We spoke earlier about how learning by doing is one of the most powerful ways for young people to be able to absorb skills. And so apprenticeships is often the vehicle to achieve that. Um, but as we all know, not all apprenticeships are created equal. Um, and further, there is a limited number of apprenticeship seats that are available. And so we are, we've, we've now been observing a, a, a more nascent phenomenon called serious games, which are a serious, essentially video games that mimic the workplace context. Um, and so through repeated play of the game, uh, young, young people are able to gain practical skill, and there is early evidence now that each time the game is played, this, the level of skill increases by 10 to 15 percent up until a threshold. So this is a way for there to be a hands-off learning approach, but in a way that provides it with much more hands-on learning. Um, and so we think that this is, an, this is an area that is fruitful to watch. It is not a replacement for actual sitting by someone's side. But it is significantly better than having no practicum whatsoever. And what's, what, what's critical across the board is finding ways to take both the hard skills and the soft skills and integrate them in such a way that it's played out in these serious games, uh, which I'm happy to talk about further. So I will just pause here, um, and I think we then transition to the panel.